Dr. Lisa Lipman has always wanted to be a veterinarian. Growing up in New Jersey, she pursued her passions in biology and public relations at Syracuse University. She completed a pre-medical program at the University of Pennsylvania, then went on to earn her DVM degree at Western University of Health Sciences College of Veterinary Medicine in Southern California. While in vet school, Dr. Lippman was president of the Holistic Club, vice president of the Internal Medicine Club, and events coordinator of the Surgery Club. However, one of her proudest accomplishments to date has been playing an integral role in changing a California state law called Molly's Bill. After graduating from veterinary school in 2013, Dr. Lippman moved home to New York City and completed a one-year internship at Blue Pearl Veterinary Partners. Dr. Lippman has worked as both a general practitioner, relief ER veterinarian, and a house call veterinarian and is in the process of starting her own house call practice. Dr. Lippman's special interests are dermatology, internal medicine, emergency, and critical care. Dr. Lippman also co-hosts a podcast called Pets and punchlines with her life partner and comedian, Richie Redding, and has appeared on Dr. Oz, Fox's Chasing News, and Good Day New York. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Lippman. Thank you for being here. Thanks with for me. having me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, super excited. I yeah. gave you a long bio. That was, that was kind of a long bio. <laughs> no, no, no. I've done a lot of things. I'm old already, I think. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's all very interesting. And I, I loved reading the bio because that's, uh, you know, that's how I know what to ask you about. It makes me curious about your life. But right. um, you always wanted to be a veterinarian since you were a little kid. And that's pretty much what I've heard from every single person I've interviewed so far. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you this instead, since we know the answer to that question. What did you think it was going to be like to be a veterinarian? What was your vision? Oh, wow. um, you know, I, I really just thought about helping the animals, right? And, and I knew, you know, the old joke, like, if you, you know, if you, if you, you know, I, I want to be a veterinarian because I like animals and not people. And I really, truly do love people. I've always loved people. Um, but I think I really... I loved that idea of really helping animals and helping the people who love them. I love people who love animals. Those are people I want to be around. Those are people I want to be friends with. Um, and those are people I really want to help because they love their animals just like I love my animals. So um, I thought it would be all about helping the animals. That's what I thought it would be. Um, it turns out it's a lot more than that. So um, I just say I think I, yeah, it, it's a lot more than that. So yeah. it's really interesting that you say that because I think I had, I didn't think of it when I was a kid, but when I did decide I wanted to become a vet, that's what I thought. Like, oh, you know, right. people who love animals, those are my people. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Those are my people. So those yeah. are people I want to be with. Yeah. And then, um, you know, I, I interviewed at Western University and. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm hmm. But, a t and I, I love their, um, their like reverence for life policy. That's one of the reasons right. I applied there because yeah. you know, I knew that I wouldn't have to like do terminal surgeries or anything. That's that right. I found, you know, I, yeah. um, <clears throat> questionable, but, um, I ended up not going there first of all, because it was, it, you know, it was very expensive, but also we did a, a mock problem-based learning session while uh -huh. I, was, I was there, you know, all the other applicants. And I, I think problem-based learning is amazing. And I think that, you know, I, I probably would have loved it later on in my education. But at that point, just having an undergraduate degree, I was like, oh, I, what? <laughs> yeah. I, he just gave us a case and then was like, okay, go to town. And yeah. And, and yeah, it can was, be really intimidating. Um, it was definitely, it's a love-hate with problem-based learning. So either you, you love it or you struggle with it. So it's, um, it's definitely a different way of learning. Yeah, but to start out that way. Um, yeah, I think, I think the hardest thing was really, um, you know, we didn't have, like when you're given a lecture and like, I knew I was really good at that. It was scary for me because I was jumping into something that I, I really had no idea, um, you know, if I, if I would be good at it or not, because I knew that I could, I, I'm really good at memorizing things. So I could be given a lecture and memorize the whole thing and, and be fine. But I had no idea if there were no notes. So basically it was like, learn a topic and you could go to a book 
And you could read 200 pages on the topic. You could read multiple books on the topic and have no idea if you were learning what they thought was important for you to write, what you're supposed to be learning. And we would take tests. So we would have exams like every two weeks. Uh, and they were like, I'm oh, sorry, every, every four to eight weeks, actually. And it would be like a mini board test. So there would be like pages of questions where I'd be like, don't know this page, don't know that page. But then the whole next page you would know, you know? And so it was like, it, it was, it's a crazy way to learn. Yeah, for sure. Right. I mean, um, I think once you get the fundamentals down. Um, I'm not sure. Of- you just never know. You never knew. You never knew if you were doing it right. Um, oh my gosh. And, which that is, would make which me is- crazy. I like, yeah. I'm a control freak. And I think a lot of people who, you know, go into veterinary medicine or medicine in general are used yeah. to having like that control and predictability and structure. Yes, I agree. And, um, but I think it does also prepare you for real life, right? Cause real life is kind of a lot like that. And then once you get into the real world, you start practicing, you realize what is or isn't important. Um, And so, but you also have the tools to be able to use your resources and look it up. So, Mm -hmm. so Western did, did really well for me. And then I, and I wound up thriving in that that environment and I loved it. And I think partially because they really, um, they really harp on uh, working together, like teamwork. They really encourage you to work with your, other friends and vet students. And I had a great group of friends that we studied with and we all helped collaborate with resources and things like that. So I, I personally loved it, but I can see how people would struggle with it. So. Yeah. I I found it terrifying. Just like that mock session. I was like, Oh no, no, no. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's different. Anything different is going to be terrifying. You know what you're good at, you know, you know, if you got through college and you did well and you applied to vet school, it's kind of the same, you know, it's, it's the, I don't think veterinary medicine is really rocket science. I think that it's more the volume, the sheer volume of what you have to know is more intimidating. Yeah, yeah. But certainly um, in that kind of environment, like you said, not even being sure what you were supposed to know. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah. Missing whole pages on tests. Being like, nope, didn't study that. Don't know that. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. And then for like when you you were preparing to take um, the NABLE, um, did, did they, did the college give you any help with that or any coaching with that? Or did you oh my feel God, like was... you were going to be prepared? Yeah. So I, I felt prepared because I felt like every, like I said, like every test I took, it was, you know, like two, it was like a mini board exam basically. So I felt prepared for like the length and, and the amount of questions and things like that. We did have, it's like so long ago. It's so hard for me to remember now, I think, but, um, it, we did have, a mandatory board study session where actually I was away. I think I was back on the East coast and I had to fly back to California to do this three day board study session. Uh, so we did have a mandatory board study session for, I think, I think it was like three days. Um, and I also did, was it zoo crew review? Oh that? yes. I used or was that. it, pro- or was it zoo? No, well I signed up for zoo crew's free questions, but there was another service. Right. I can't um, remember the other one. Oh my goodness. There was an, I think it starts with a P. I don't know. There was another service, the one that everybody does. I did it. And I think that that probably helped me the most. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, and then you also mentioned in your um, bio that you played a role in changing the California state law called Molly's Bill. Do you want to talk a little bit about what, yeah. what that was? And what yeah, I love that. that um, so that was a that was the law that we enacted that basically allows for veterinarians to provide medical exemptions to the existing rabies law. So to be able to say, you know, your old, chronically ill, elderly dog does not necessarily need a rabies vaccine if the veterinarian thinks that that is warranted. So I did it for multiple reasons. Um, The bill is in reference to a Springer Spaniel named Molly. Uh, who had IMHA, and the counties at the time were allowing exemptions for um, for being exempt from the rabies vaccine, but the state law was not, there was no state law that said it. So some uh, licensing bodies said that this isn't good enough, your dog still needs to be vaccinated, we don't care that it has immune-mediated hemolytic anemia or any other awful you know, immune mediated disease or is chronically ill. If you don't vaccinate your dog, you are in violation of the law. 
and they find this family and they actually took them to court, even though there are multiple veterinarians had written notes saying that she should not ever be vaccinated again. Uh, and, and then I had a dog with an immune, with a pemphigus foliaceus, so immune mediated skin disease. And the same thing happened to me. So I tried to be responsible and I tried to vaccine to, sorry, to license my dog when I got to California. Well, the next year when he was sick, they came knocking on my door and they were threatening to find me and tell me that, you know, I was in violation of the law if I didn't vaccinate my sick elderly 12 year old Ridgeback. And I said, well, this is ridiculous. At the same time I saw the law came out and I, I got in touch with the assemblyman who was putting that law on. And I started a petition in vet school and I had over 3,000 3, signatures on change.org. And uh, the HSVMA, the Humane Society vet Veterinary Medical Association was sponsoring the bill. They flew me to the state capitol to testify in front of eight senators. Um, I was one of three people to testify and, uh, and the law got passed. And, and so I did it for two reasons. I did it uh, you know, obviously for the health of the animals, they're doing a lot of studies now where they find that the rabies vaccine, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with lasts longer than three years. Just like when we get vaccinated, we get titered. Um, we don't get vaccinated every three years for rabies. Uh, and also, all, and obviously for the health of the animals, but also really to put medicine back in the hands of veterinary professionals. Uh, because it's amazing what the law can dictate and, you know, law can dictate medicine. It was amazing when we were even trying to pass the law, they, the senators kept coming up with like all kinds of restrictions or they wanted us to make like a list of all the diseases that could possibly <laughs> provide an exemption. And we were just like that. It's, that's impossible. That's not that's how just, this that's, works. Yeah. That's not how that's this not works. That's how it's medicine absolutely, works. Yeah. It's, it was absolutely impossible. And and really just so eye-opening to me to see how much, yeah, the law can dictate what we do. You know, we go to school, we do all this training. I mean, you know, I'm preaching to the choir, I think, but like it's, it, it was just very scary to, to be honest, to see how they could really dictate how we practice medicine. So mm -hmm. it was to put, to put medicine back in the hands of, of, of the profession. So yeah. Yeah. it was an incredible experience. And then the whole state law got changed. Um, and the other thing I will say is that, you know, I, I did have a lot of, the last thing I'll say on is I did have a lot of people contact me and say, you know, yay, like anti-vaxxers basically, yes, you know? Yes. And I so to talk to you about yeah. that because <laughs> I think it's really important to distinguish here. Like you're not doing yes. that because you don't believe in vaccinations. Right. Exactly. And I would tell talking about here. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I would say to these people, you know, it's, it's actually exactly the opposite. The, okay. the rabies vaccine and our vaccinations have allowed the human bond animal bond to flourish. It is the reason why we have been able to coexist with animals in a safe and incredible way. Uh, so without vaccines, we would be out of luck. We would probably um, have, but it. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It would be much, much more dangerous for us, but in very specific instances, when you are a certified veterinarian who can make these decisions, then sometimes the, 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 the medicine needs to be in the hands of the professionals. So mm -hmm. very, very different. I definitely believe in vaccines. Um, I just think it needs to be at our discretion and tailored right. to an individual patient. So. And I mean, the reason why the, the rabies vaccine, um, you, you can have this exception for the rabies vaccine in chronically ill um, animals or, or animals that have a history of immune mediated diseases is because of the whole concept of like herd protection, right? Because if most of the animals are vaccinated, that gives a buffer. So yeah, you know, so there's, there's herd like protection. Human. Yeah, there's herd protection. And there's so many thoughts about the law too, is that these are not the animals who are going outside. Mm -hmm. These are not the animals who are really at high risk. Mm -hmm. um, these are also owner, you know, also let's not forget that 50% of people typically just don't even vaccinate their animals. Mm -hmm. So then to have a law that's going to make it more difficult for them will probably discourage people from vaccinating animals and doing the right thing, discourage them from going to the veterinarian. Uh, so yeah, so, so hurt, hurt health for sure. I mean, it's like the rabies flu is vaccine. so rare here now. Yeah. Um, you know, people who work at human hospitals have to get the flu vaccine. Right. And it's not necessarily because they care whether or not you get the flu, but right. it's to protect right. other people. As sure. Well. 
Sure. So you don't bring it in and right. Right. The so the people, more people right who now. are protected, that's like a, yeah. it's almost like a barrier. The virus comes, you know, into contact with the barrier and it can go right. no further. But, so we had to get it at school. It was mandatory at school for us to get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So they wanted us to have herd health. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's social responsibility, but yeah. you know, then there are also medical exceptions for humans too. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. So, oh, good job. Good job. I'm yeah. glad to hear that. But yeah, oh, I mean, thanks, my concern yeah. when I re read that was like, wow, what are anti-vaxxers going to think about it? Because yeah. I did read, I did see a couple of websites where they were like, oh, you know, this means that, you know, we don't have to push this poison on our pets. Right. Like, no, no, no. So, yeah. you know, vaccine, it's at their veterinary's discretion. So yeah. no, you know, veterinarian. It's not because the rabies vaccine is poisonous. Right. It's not right. that it's that, you know, the other, the other reason that I did the way that I describe it is, you know, there's a risk to any vaccine. And every time you give a vaccine, you stimulate the immune system. That's what a vaccine is supposed to do. So for an animals in particular with immune mediated diseases, giving them a vaccine that could stimulate an already out of control immune system could be harmful to them. Mm -hmm. And also they're likely protected. So always get vaccinated to begin with. Um, you probably still have, or the animal probably still has the titers. Uh, but yeah, it's not because the vaccine is poison. The vaccine is right. not. Right. Definitely it's not. just like any medical treatment, any drug. Right. You know, I could take a drug and be perfectly fine. You could take the same drug and have right. an adverse yes. allergic reaction. Right. But you know, typically. That doesn't mean that it's poisonous and bad and like big right. pharma is trying to control your life. Right. Typically, you know, uh, the benefit far outweighs the risk and that's mm -hmm. everything that we do in medicine. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. All yeah. right. And then, um, oh, one other question I wanted to ask you about Western, it was because it was another concern of mine. I had four dogs, four uh, dogs and three cats when I started uh -huh. med school and they didn't have a teaching hospital. So I, I knew that I would probably have to like move around a lot in my fourth year for clinical rotations. And right. was that challenging for you? Cause I know you had a dog. I don't know how many pets you had. Yeah, it's, it definitely can be a challenge for some people. Um, for me, it was a benefit actually. That's what I really liked about it because my family was on the East coast. So for me, it was like, oh, well, I think everybody's got to live in California once in their lives. And I love the idea of going there. But I really like the idea of being there for three years instead of four years. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a big benefit for me because I could go back. I did my fourth year rotations mostly on the East Coast. So I could be back home. Um, but uh, for a lot of people, when I did those rotations, yeah. I mean, my, my dog stayed with at the time, my boyfriend and my parents a lot. Uh, it's definitely hard. I mean, it's hard enough doing rotations as a fourth year, let alone moving every month. So, and you could only do two rotations in the same place. So, um, yeah, it's, it can be, it can be hard, but also you can make it easier too. Cause like if you could, if you could live at home or you have a friend you can stay with, you can also make it very, very cheap, you know, going from place to place month to month. Like maybe you don't have to pay rent for the whole year. So I think it just really depends on your personal situation with six dogs and having nobody to watch them but yourself, then that that could definitely be a challenge. Oh, it was a bit of an imposition on you. Have six friend. dogs. You have no, six dogs right I have now. Four you have, dogs when I started. Four dogs. School. Four oh, dogs four. and three okay. cats. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, have, I have three dogs now. Um, Got it. Yeah. So that was a big concern with me. Like if, if I had one dog, I, I might've, you know, it might've been manageable, but right. Just, yeah, sure. I did not think I would be able to make that work. Even one's really sure. hard. Yeah. The responsibilities of being on clinics and yeah. preparing for navlies and all that stuff. So hard. Yeah. Okay. So you spent your fourth year on the East coast pretty much. Yeah, I did. I wrote, I well, so that was another benefit was that I rotated through all of the hospitals I thought I wanted to do my internships at so nice. that they knew me and I could get recommendations from people who work there. Um, so that was, that was a really big deal to me. Yeah. And, um, you always knew that you wanted to do an internship. Did you, were you thinking of specializing or you just wanted to do an internship? Uh, no, yeah, I thought I was going to specialize for sure. I mean, I, I was, I hit it hard in vet school. I was a gunner. I was, you know, I, I worked really hard to get really good grades um, and have all my options open to me. I thought, I thought I wanted to do a derm residency. 
Um, but I got talked out of that in my internship. <laughs> also, I, I realized that I loved everything. And also, I realized that I wanted to have a life. So I, I wanted to have a life. I wanted to start paying off my loans. None of that like really hit me until after internship. So I definitely don't regret not no, doing actually. a residency. Sure. Yeah, I don't regret that. Yeah. Well, tell me about the internship at Blue Pearl Veterinary Partners in New York. Um, I liked it. I mean, it was my first choice internship. Um, so I, they had two amazing dermatologists at the time that I really loved. They had every specialist at the time. They had everything from like behavior, neurology, oncology, dermatology. They had like every specialist I really wanted to, every specialty I really wanted to rotate through. Um, and it was in New York City and it was home and it was fun. Uh, so I, I really liked it. It was busy. Um, I definitely maybe started to feel a little bit of the burnout at the end. You know, Manhattan is, Manhattan is a different breed. It's definitely, you have to want to be here in order to practice medicine here. Uh, my, our clients are, you know, they're really smart. They're really savvy. Everything moves at a really fast pace. Uh, they're, they're with it and they're demanding. So, uh, yeah, so it could be, it's an interesting environment. Mm. And did you have uh, emergency duty while you were there on your internship? Uh, yeah. So we rotated, we did, was it, I think like two months of emergency, not a ton of emergency, uh, but I, we did. But and we, you know, with one thing I did miss was general practice. We did not have general practice there. Wow. They're very cognizant of uh, not interfering with general practitioners because it's a referral hospital. So yeah. that's one of the things with, uh, you know, it's, not a teaching hospital. It's a very busy private practice and they really want to keep their, their referral practitioners happy. So we didn't practice any general medicine. And did, do you feel like that hindered you at all when you um, finished your internship and started practicing? A little bit, a little bit. Yeah. Cause it is so different. Um, I think we could have done, we could do out rotations and maybe if you really knew you wanted to do general practice, you could do that. But I would say if you really want to know you do if you really want to do general practice, make sure you get some general practice experience. So I, I definitely felt like, yeah, there were things. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's simple things like, you know, I felt like I was like better equipped to handle a DKA than like a newly di diagnosed diabetic, <laughs> you know, cause like those are the things you see in general practice that come in. You have to start from scratch about what to do as opposed to when you're working at a specialty hospital and just working at like really complicated cases. Right. So, or ER. Yeah. Or ER. Totally different. Exactly. So that's why I, right out of my internship, I did emergency for a year and a half. Um, and I was like, and then I did general practice for a year. And, you know, I was like, I'm like, give me, give me a DK, give me a hemo abdomen, but like a newly diagnosed diabetic. What do I do with that? So yeah. Right. Yes, yeah. I know. I know. I felt yeah. that too because I started out uh, in ER and as in cha and challenging as it was being a new grad, that's the stuff that you learn most about in, in vet school. Exactly. That's the stuff yeah. you see on clinical rotation. But, but even, yeah, when, even though I felt like when you learn about it in vet school, you just, you learn about it in a book, it's very different than doing it in real life too. Yes, absolutely. But um, yeah. I feel like a lot of the stuff that I saw in general practice I don't uh, like anal gland, anal sac abscess. Did we yeah. have a lecture on that? No. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. What do you, yeah. What do you actually do when it comes to it? Like, sure. I can learn all about it, but yeah. Like what, are, what are the tools I need literally, you know, and, and how does it get done? So yes. yeah. Yes. Um, and, but when you were on your clinical rotations as a fourth year student, before you did your internship, did you, did you not do any clinical rotations at a general practice? Uh, when I was on my fourth year, when I was yeah. on my fourth year rotations, yeah. um, no, it was all specialty hospitals because I wow. really focused on where I wanted to get my internship. Oh, okay. Because I thought that would set me up for residency. And right. so I don't think I did any. We had two mandatory rotations. We had one mandatory rotation in internal medicine and one internal, uh, one mandatory rotation in surgery. But yeah, I had no, yeah, I didn't do any general practice. Yeah. And I worked at general practice 
you know, as a, as like an assistant and as a tech before vet school. Yeah. Um, but I didn't, that was really all the general practice I did. So Interesting. pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And did you have to do did any you, more? You did general practice in your rotations? Um, I did a couple of elective, let's see, I did right. one elective general practice at an outside uh, small right. hospital. And yeah. we did, um, Virginia, Maryland did have a community practice rotation, but it was pretty right. new. And they were still struggling with the same thing. Like you mentioned with Blue Pearl Veterinary Partners, they're a specialty yeah. hospital. They depend on referrals from day practices. So if they have their own day practice, they're going to be in competition with the people that, you know, right. like who wants to send their pet to the yeah. specialty center yeah. if they know that they might lose them because they've got right. a general practice. So our vet school had just started the community practice and there was debate about, you know, was there going to be backlash from the veter from day practice veterinarians? So it was the right. same. It was slow. There weren't a lot yeah. of cases. Well, you know what? We did rotate through, I'm sorry. We, I guess I, we did do a little general practice. We did rotate through Banfields. So we did have to rotate through some uh, Banfields, but I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't much, you know? So I, I take that back. There wasn't no general practice, but it wasn't much. Okay. You, you were required to do a rotation at Banfield? Yeah, because Banfield, you know, I, I don't know. They, they, it's a part of Western. Like they give a lot of money to Western, I guess, or something. Um, there's a Banfield on, on the hospital. So I think just one or I think like two weeks at a Banfield as maybe the general practice rotation. I don't remember. And, you know, maybe, maybe that changes maybe that changed now. But yeah, I think at the time we, we were required to rotate through a Banfield. Okay. And did you have to do any rotations in, in large animal medicine? Yeah, we did. Yeah. yeah. So that was required in our third year, not in our fourth year, but in our third year. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So they wow. flew us to Nebraska for two weeks where we did like a beef cattle rotation. They fly everybody to Nebraska. Pretty crazy. Um, and uh, I did two weeks on a dairy farm in Temecula, which was super cool um, because they had their, we, we lived in the dairy hospital and they had fridges full of like chocolate. This dairy worked with like Nesquik. So they had fridges full of chocolate milk and strawberry milk. And they were like, you guys can have whatever you want. And I just remember like going to bed every night with my belly hurting because I drank so much strawberry milk. <laughs> <laughs> um, we did, uh, yeah. And then I did, I did two, I did like one equine internal medicine rotation and one ambulatory. Uh, so we did, okay. we did, we were required to do a large one. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for yeah. indulging my curiosity about Western. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I love, overall, I loved it. I mean, I, I just loved it. I think they're really good at picking people, you know, for, with great bedside manner for, you know, with life experience with, um, I just loved it. And I had an opportunity to be really close with some of my professors. I think that never would have happened in a typical lecture situation. Um, it was a really special time. I really loved it. So, oh, okay. overall. Yeah. Good to hear. Good to hear. Yeah. Um, and then, so although, now, although okay. I'm not sure anything could have prepared me for real, being a real life veterinarian. So I'll just say that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's so difficult to say, like you and I went through, um, you know, we went through different veterinary colleges and they had very right. different curricula, but, um, so it's hard. Like, I can't say, did mine prepare me better for the real world or did yeah. yours? Like, and neither of us know that for sure. Yeah. We don't feel I, like I, I, was, I was not prepared for reality. just the real life for reality, for dealing with the people, for the pay, with the paperwork, with the, with the pace, with dealing with what corporate medicine is. Um, I, I wasn't prepared for any of that. So yeah. So tell me about just like when you finished your internship, um, and 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 then did you start working immediately after that as a full time uh, GP vet? Um, so when I finished my internship, I I took like a month off, and I really thought that I wanted to do per diem because I didn't know if I wanted to do general practice or emergency, and so I thought, well, let me try to pick up some shifts at both at an emergency place and a general practice and see what I want to be when I grow up. Um, and I got recruited to an emergency hospital. They, they reached out to me, they made me a great offer. And one of my really good friends from internship also took a job there. So that just made it like, Oh yeah, I should do that. But it turned out it was a two hour commute each way. The schedule was just really long overnights, multiple nights in a row. Um, it was not a 
I had a clash with one of the veterinarians there, you know, in personalities. It was, it was very, very difficult first job. And I think that that really left a bad taste in my mouth. Um, but I stayed, you know, I stuck it out because that's kind of what we do. Even though looking back on it now, it's like, I don't think you should ever say in something that you're not happy. There are a ton of veterinary jobs out there. <laughs> um, and so I stayed until one of my friends, um, had a, a position opening in, in their private practice, in general practice in Manhattan, um, where, you know, they made me the same offer and it wasn't the commute and it wasn't overnights or, you know, two hours. Yeah. So hmm. I forgot the original question, but <laughs> so, oh, right, so okay. I did, I did emergency coming right out and okay. then, and then general practice. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I hear from a lot of veterinarians where the first place that they worked, um, what wasn't a very good fit for them. Yeah. And that's what I'm hearing. But in terms of just the medicine, like just starting out and you had done an internship at a special yeah. hospital. So I'm just curious, like from the medical standpoint, how, how was it to be, you know, in yeah, it was, really, it was still really hard. You know, I think every internship is so different and as busy as we were at Blue Pearl and as much, I, I, I think I learned more in like hindsight, it, it at first didn't feel like I had learned that much. Um, but then I, with a little bit more experience, I realized how much I have learned from them. Um, if that makes sense. So, cause at yeah. first it was like, everything was kind of, I mean, I panicked the first night before my job because at Blue Pearl also, we were never left alone. There was always a senior doctor on with us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and somebody always was going over our case. So to be making those decisions then completely on my own, to yeah. being the only doctor on overnight, it was a big change. It was a really big change. Um, yeah. And uh, I didn't necessarily feel really supported at my first hospital either. So it was a big change. Uh, yeah. Were there, was there a surgeon on call? Or there was a surgeon on call, oh. yes. And, okay. and that's, yeah, yeah. There, yeah, I don't do surgery. You don't do surgery. No. Okay. I don't do surgery. And, I, and part of that is because, um, you know, I really just never had a ton of experience in surgery. I didn't, a lot of my friends went away. They did like the wrap trips. I think that helped them the most. Um, I, I didn't do that. And um, you know, right. we had like, yeah. Um, and at Blue Pearl, we really did not get, we didn't get any surgery. We had five months of surgery rotation, oddly. But it was like, I got really great at like anesthetic protocols and closing up bellies. But like, we weren't the ones doing the surgery because this is a high scale private practice mm -hmm. where people are paying for surgeons to do their surgery. We did not do the surgeries. Mm -hmm. So I really didn't feel confident. I didn't have a lot of surgery skills. And then doing emergency, right? There was, I always did emergency at like specialty hospitals. You know, I'm still in New York. People want board certified surgeons doing their surgery as they should. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I never did it. And so when I, that was another hard thing about transitioning to private practice too. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the place where I started there, there were not surgeons on call. So, but I, Oh, right. So you want it. So it's like, yeah, it's very different. Right. So you were kind of thrown yeah. into it, but I, I'm but kind of envious thing. you have those skills, but I don't know how, Right. I'm not like a look at a book. I can't like look at a book and just do surgery. I need somebody to help me through it. Um, I can memorize anything, but but doing surgery like that, I would have walked out. I don't know how you did. <laughs> I do not know. Yeah. You're my hero. You uh -huh. are my absolute hero. So yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's uh, it's one of those things where you don't realize how difficult it is, and until you're actually in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I yeah. remember feeling like being an overnight vet, like what you right. were describing and having all those decisions to make and nobody, like it's just you. It's, yeah. It was very lonely. Like being alone in the middle of the night as an ER vet, I found very yeah. lonely. Yeah, it was lonely. There's a certain quiet to it that I like also, but um, more so like, yeah, it's just and that's not the way it is in human medicine, right? It's just, it's never that way. So mm -hmm. like you can get things done if you need to get them done, I think. So yeah. So um, that's when, after you uh, left the ER job, that's when you did some time at a general uh, practice. Yep. Okay. So wh yep. how was that for you? 
Um, so that was good. I really liked the doctors I work with. I was extremely micromanaged by my boss at the time. Was um, it a vet? Yeah, okay. he's a vet. Yeah, yeah, and that's the thing. Also, for a lot of people to know, a lot of people in management are not vets. Um, so you have people managing you who don't have any veterinary experience, and so that can be frustrating. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the time, and then, you know, he had said that he would teach me surgery and, you know, mentor me. And it turned out he really didn't want to do that. So Mm -hmm. it wasn't, didn't wind up being a good fit. Um, and then, yeah, basically I, I found my friend who started the house call practice and I said, I love this. I really want to do this with you. Um, and I did that for about a year and now I'm starting my own practice. So. Yeah. Right, and you you mentioned um, when we talked previously that it, house call practice is different from mobile practice. So can you tell me? Right. I had never even known that there. Yeah. <laughs> what's what's uh, the difference? Yeah, I mean, I think ba- basically mobile implies that um, that you have a mobile unit, uh, so like uh, a truck that you work out of and stuff. I don't I don't have a truck, so I'm not quite mobile. I'm just house call. I come to your house um, or wherever you need me. Um, but are you and, riding the train? I mean, what do you mean by a truck? It has to have like a surgical suite on the truck or can it be like out the back of your grandmother's Ponda Civic that you inherit? Yeah. I think like mobile is you bring the clinic to the person, uh-huh. but house call is like I'm going into your house. Like I am the oh, clinic. So I see. mobile I- is, yeah, you have a vehicle. It's, it's pretty much it. Yeah. Vehicle that's equipped for, I'm not sure if every mobile surgeon or every, sorry, every mobile veterinarian does surgery but they have a vehicle that they practice out of. So they bring the hospital to you and probably the people will bring their pet onto the vehicle and you practice out of that vehicle. Whereas house call is like, I'm going into your house or going wherever you need me. And some people are consider themselves both. Right. Um, but I think technically, um, I'm pretty sure technically that's the difference. Okay. Well, thank you for explaining that. Yeah. To me. <laughs> Initially, I was like, so does that mean she takes the train? <laughs> well, I do. Yeah. You live right. in New York. Okay. Yeah. I take a train. I do have a car. Sometimes I will drive, but like I, I still don't consider myself mobile. I don't practice out of that vehicle at all. Okay. So I okay. still, I just go to your house. Okay. Well, um, so before we move on, because I want to talk about you know the process of starting your own house call business and all that, but now that we've covered you know the veterinary school and your first couple of jobs right out of veterinary school, um, having begun with your vision of being a veterinarian, how similar or different were they? The reality versus the vision you had. What like the vision that drove you to become a veterinarian? Um, yeah, it's different. <laughs> it's really different. Um, I think I'm just finding my love for it again, to be honest. Um, it, it is, it's really hard. I found that, um, for me, I'm, I'm really not that good at having a boss. (laughs) I really, really don't like being micromanaged or talked down to. And it's, some people just will, and they're running a business and, and I get it. And, um, but there's a lot of personalities out there veterinary medicine is now about 80% female and you know, you're talking about smart type a, you know, my, my boyfriend always says he thinks veterinary medicine is like a very well educated hair salon. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, <laughs> I you know, it's, that. it's a lot of, yeah, it's a lot of estrogen and, and, and emotions, especially in veterinary medicine. And, yeah. um, you know, you, you ask five different vets how to do one thing. They'll give you five different answers, but you have to get comfortable in your own way. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a lot. I absolutely love practicing when I'm practicing with people that I love that are smart where we can collaborate and do best medicine. Um, but people can be very difficult. I had no idea. And not only can people be difficult, but you can be asked to see, um, you know, five of those people in like a very short amount of time, you know, that it just, it's very different. It's very important to know when you go to a clinic, do you have 15 minute appointments? Do you have 30 minute appointments? Do you have 20 minute appointments? Like I had no idea the differences at that time and what that I, would really mean for me. I yeah, knew I, me neither. Yeah, you know what? I, had, and I, I never even knew that like human medical doctors, yeah. like right. I they don't, they see. don't tell you when you book an appointment, like, Oh, exactly. you only have 15 minutes. No. Yeah. If, right. if they so, did, I would be more respectful. You exactly. Know? 
Exactly. So, but people don't know that. No. So they think you just have all day with them. Yeah. Um, but not only are you, can you be scheduled for every 15 minute appointments, but sometimes receptionists will book you. So I've been in situations where receptionists will double, triple book me for a 15 minute appointment where, you know, they think it's something simple like a vaccine, but it's never something simple. And they ask you, you know, they ask you about everything from like their dog's ears to their other dog. You know, it's like, it's never that simple. Um, and you have no option, but to see those animals because maybe the practice is corporate owned, or maybe that's the way that the owner wants it. So Mm -hmm. you, you don't have an option to say no, um, or you don't feel like you have an option to say no, you might have it, but you know, that's going to create tension or animosity or, or whatever it is. Um, and then the, and the truth is at the end of the day, I'm capable, I'm very efficient. Um, but I don't, I don't like it. It's not best medicine. So yeah. No, so, I, I mean you. I don't care how capable or efficient you are. Yeah. You, nobody yeah. can practice good medicine under those circumstances. I agree. Right. So that's what I love about house call. You know, is that I find it's actually really best medicine because I I can spend an hour with my patients. I have time to really think about them and work them up and get to know them, see them in their own environment. Um, my house call clients right now have access to me. I really like them. I choose them. I'm not going to be forced to see somebody who abuses me mm. to make the practice money. Like I'm, I'm not going to do that. So, um, uh, where I, as I once thought that, you know, that's the way that it should be. Uh, you know, I worked on the upper West side where I saw a lot of old ladies <laughs> and as much as I love some of them, some of them can be really mean, really, really mean. Um, And, uh, so I'm going to choose my clients, you know, and, uh, a lot of them are referral based and, and I really get, and, and, you know, I also don't feel like I need to keep them to make my hospital money. I can refer them to the best people that I know. Mm -hmm. Um, so I find it to be really best medicine. Uh, yeah. So at the, you make it sound like at one of the places where you worked, you, you weren't given the autonomy to refer your patients to specialists. You were expected to keep them. Cause I, right, I was exactly. in a similar like if you, if situation. Keep, yeah, um, at, exactly. At, yep. uh, if you can keep them in house, keep them in house because money, to be honest, I mean, right. you know, and, uh, and, and, you know, only refer out if it absolutely is like not capable of being done in house. So, you know, there's always five ways to do things, but can you do them the best way is a gold standard. Have you offered your client all of their options? You know, we were taught in vet school and which I, and I firmly believe is that even if you don't think your client can afford it, even if they tell you, you can't afford it, they, I still tell them what their options are because you just never know. You never Mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, you, 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 they need to understand that the prognosis is statistically more likely to be positive if they right. see the specialist. Sure, yeah. yeah. Yeah, whether they can afford it or not, but they need to yeah. understand that. Yeah, so, so it's, it's tough. You know, it's one thing to love it, but you can love, I love, eat, I love M&Ms, but when I eat 20 bags of them, I'm going to get really sick. So it's like, <laughs> that's, you know. That's a great analogy. Kind of like, yeah. Right. That, and you know, that's, that's really interesting. And you're the first person who said anything like that, but <clears throat> it's a really interesting point. And that yeah. is that, I mean, veterinary, veterinary medicine is, I, I don't think I was prepared for all, how all consuming it can be. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it is, it's like eating 20 bags of M&Ms. Yeah. Well, yeah. And how like, so, so, you know, so much of it is when it's out of your control uh-huh. um, and pe- you just never know what people are going to do. Mm-hmm. It's hard. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. really hard. Yeah. And um, so you've been out for what, four years now, right? Yeah, you graduated four five. in 2013, four to five. Yeah. yeah. So this is a time when um, also everybody that I've spoken to, they generally say like it's around year four or five that you start to feel like you've actually found your feet as a veterinarian. Yeah, I do just now, I agree, feel much more. There are certain things I know that like I still haven't done, but like I, it's there, I definitely feel way more comfortable now and I can see it takes really, yeah, a good five years. And also it's different, a little different for me because I've, I've been all over the place. You know, I think when you practice one thing, it's, that's even better. 
but because I've done emergency and I've done general practice, like I still learn so many new things every day, but I'm much more confident in my ability to handle them. If mm-hmm. that makes sense also yeah. and yeah. know where to go and where to turn. Yes. Um, but yes, I definitely feel much better now. I mean, I think about that almost every day. I'm like, oh yeah, experience is everything. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So those yeah. first four or five years are, are, are the toughest. Yeah, just, definitely. Like, I, th- just I think so. And I hope so. Fine. And also, like I said, I'm also finding what I love. I know mm-hmm. now what really doesn't work for me. I'm right. finding like, I just, you know, so because I'm starting this house call practice, I still pick up per DM shifts to make ends meet all over the place, you know? And so yeah. Um, I'm still doing a lot of emergency work and general practice. And I, I like literally last week just decided like, I really can't do any more overnights, you know, like for me, like they'll, they're going to kill me. So like, I would rather like beg or get another job than <laughs> do another emergency overnight right now. So what that's about, you know, uh, day practice relief work or, oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I just have to hope that enough of that comes in. But I, um, I really want to try to avoid in the new year doing emergency overnights anymore. Yeah, those are incredibly if tough I, on your body. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah, it's just so tough. Yeah, it, so many things about it. So um, I don't know. Maybe maybe I got burnt out on that too because I was doing a lot of emergency overnights at a place that was fourteen hour shifts, and it was like an hour to two hour drive away from me too. So I think that that kind of killed it for me. Right. Um, you know, if they're like twelve hours, it just depends. It's so hospital dependent. Some places you can sleep at, some places you can't sleep at. Yeah. You know, it's just it's very dependent. So so much of it depends. But overall, I know that I overnights are if I can avoid them, I will. Right. Well, especially since the house call practice is a day practice, but you know, you're operating during yeah. the day. So throwing in an overnight here and there. Yeah. And it, at night I go, sure. I go at night too. I try to, I go around people's schedules. So for me, but not in the um, middle of the night, you're not doing like 4 a.m. No, calls. no, I'm not. I, I mean, I could, if I wanted to, it's really up to me, which I love, which I love that. Right. Yeah. If, if I want to go, I can go. Um, Are you on but 24 seven. No, right. Okay. Right now. I'm not right okay. now. I'm not. No, no. So. Oh, that's kind of interesting though. You know, I've thought about, I've thought about taking calls for certain clients, like doing a membership program or something yeah. else like that. I don't know. This is all very new. Yeah. So we've thought about it, but, um, right now I'm not. So. Right. So that's, um, that's like boutique medicine, which, um, some human MDs are going into because right. I mean, uh, you know, they're different animals, human medicine, veterinary medicine, but they yep. do share a lot of similarities, but a lot of, um, MDs are getting really frustri- frustrated with being micromanaged by people who don't know anything about medicine. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And it, it takes a lot of joy out of their jobs too. So, right, right, um, sure. and insurance, like all the paperwork involved with yes. insurance and Medicare and Medicaid. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. um, some, some MDs are just opening their own boutique practices where they don't accept right. insurance. You right. pay out of pocket and um, they, you know, they, they select their clientele. And I think yep. that some of them are on call 24 seven, but it is like an right. annual membership. Right. Um, that exactly. they charge, which is yep. a really interesting business model. So that's yeah. exciting that you're thinking about that. I've, I've thought about that too. Yeah. I think, I think unfortunately a lot of people like just like being brutally honest, like, I think people won't pay what they'll, you know, the same rate that they would pay for, um, a concierge human doctor, but, but yes, the same kind of model. You, you never, I, we have to, fi- you know, figure out what works. So, right. but people pay for pet insurance. It's kind of, you know, the same, almost the same principle, except I think you'll use me a lot more. You know, you'll, you'll, a client will call and say, is this an emergency? Is not an emergency? I mean, I think if nothing else, that's golden. So. Right. And for some clients, I mean, when I was working in ER, I remember sometimes people would call and it was really heartbreaking. Their dog needed to come to the ER, but they didn't have a car, you know, right. Right. Yep. Drive them. So if, if you were yeah. on call for a client like that, you could actually take that patient to an ER. Right. Yeah. Especially Amazing. in New York, because it can be really hard to get a large dog or a cat into a carrier, into a cab, you know, whatever it is. So, yeah. So I think, um, I, I don't know. I, I like that, yeah, that business thanks. model. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> I think this is really important though for future veterinarians to keep in mind is, um, it's not like veterinary medicine is, is changing so quickly. And I think a lot of people are finding that y- you need to have an entrepreneurial spirit if you right. want to find your happiness in this field. Yeah. 
yeah, if you want to find your own niche, if being your own boss. I mean, to some people, that's not important. I think I kind of always felt I had an entrepreneurial spirit, but I didn't know how I would use it in this field. Yeah. And I'm still always looking for ways to use it. But I just know I, I really like having my own schedule. I thought, you know, I think one of the biggest differences for me, April 2, is I thought when I had this idea of what I thought veterinary medicine was or should be, I thought I would work, I could work 100 hour work weeks. I didn't need any other life. I wanted to be a hero. Yeah. And now I'm like, I want to spend time with my family. I want to sleep at night. I want to, I can't always be the hero. You just can't be. Um, and you have to, you have to let other people be. So, um, and then I just, I don't even want to be anymore. <laughs> you know, sometimes I do. So that's why I want to work, but I, but I like doing it when I'm able to do it. I like making my own schedule. That's very important to me. Right. So. I'm so glad you said that. That was really yeah. insightful. I remember yeah. thinking that too, you know, when I decided yeah. to go back to school to become a veterinarian, I thought I am going to love it so much. That's all I'm going to need in my life. Right. Right. And I think a lot yeah. of people think that and it's yeah. not and, sustainable. And you did it like me too, right? You you were old, you were older or was this a second career, right? When you went when you went to school too. So it's not like you didn't have life experience and like no, you know, what That's what true. kind of thing, no right? Excuse. Like you thought it would be so naive. No, <laughs> no, 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 it's not that but I'm just saying like it's you know, it's it's still it's a little different. Like you still think you know what real life will be like, but sometimes you just don't. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Which is the point of, you know, these podcasts and the books and yeah. everything. I think um, yeah. as long as you're prepared for it, the problem is when you get out and you're like, whoa, what? This is not yeah. what I thought. You know, that's yeah. when um, it can really knock you off your feet. Yeah. I think working with great people is everything. Everything. Having a first great job. Yeah. It's everything. It's yes. so important. And so sometimes, important. and sometimes you really just don't know until you get there and you do it. But I just don't think anybody, I think too many of us feel like we have to stay in situations that are miserable and you don't have to, mm -hmm. you don't have, I, that took me a really long time to learn, you know? So I'm still kind of learning, but yeah. Right. I mean, you know, uh, I can understand the anxiety with the loans, um, you know, monthly loan payments that are pretty intimidating and feeling like you're trapped. But I mean, I you really, I mean, we live in w one of the greatest countries on the planet, um, yeah. you know, uh, give or take, uh, you know, four years or so. Yeah. But um, <laughs> oh, right. you um, <laughs> like you're not going to starve. You're not you know, you're not going right. to die. You, right. you actually can survive without a job. It might be hard, but um, yeah. nothing is yeah. worth being miserable. And I, I, no. think I need to get a lawyer on, I need to get a veterinary lawyer on the show to talk about um, contracts because I think people do end up getting and feeling trapped by uh, contracts. So. Oh, interesting. Right. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So in addition to, you, you know, you're using your entrepreneurial spirit to start your house call practice. You and your um, your life partner uh, Richie Redding, who's a comedian, um, you you guys started a podcast called Pets and Punchlines, and you mentioned that you started that like a year ago. So what, like, what was the thinking behind that, and how did that happen, and 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 how's it going? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how's it going? <laughs> it's it's super fun. So um, it started right. So so Richie is a professional stand up comic, and um. It started because a lot of his comedian friends who have pets would call me and ask questions and like hilarity would ensue. Sometimes it would be questions like, I had eight medical marijuana gummy bears and now I have two medical marijuana gummy bears. And if I have a Yorkie weighing 10 pounds, you know, it's like, oh God. So, so hilarity would ensue and, um, I don't even know. I don't even like remember the day, but Richie must have said, you know, let's make, let's do, let's make a podcast out of this. You know, he's the creative one. I'm so not creative minded. Um, and, uh, so we did, we just started having his comedian friends over. So we call it's called pets and punchlines and it's comics with pets talking to vets and it's comics who are mostly my clients, right? So they, they get real veterinary advice on, on air. And uh, we talk about them and their love for pets and growing up with pets and all things pets. And um, we do something called the inform. Uh, we do an informative segment, which we have lovingly called the informative segment, which is like five minutes about something really useful, whether it's like a hidden danger in your kitchen to pet insurance to anything you should know. Um, 
and it's a lot of fun and we, and we love it. And we just got our, um, our first big sponsors. So that'll be coming up in the new year. And, uh, it's great. I love it. It's a lot of fun. It's a great yeah. outlet. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. And like, what kind of, um, like time commitment is it? Do you, do you publish regularly? Like once a month or once a week? Yep. We uh, release an episode every Monday. Sometimes we do uh, like midweek episodes. So if we have like an extra guest or, you know, a fun guest or we can't wait, then we'll just release one midweek. But we publish at least once weekly. Um, and uh, uh, the time commitment, the episodes are about 30 to 40 minutes. And, um, you know, I'm pretty lucky. I just, he, he does a lot of the technical stuff. I just kind of show up. Um, and, uh, but he does a lot of the technical stuff. So for me, most of the time, but it is a big time commitment. I sh I'll, I'll tell you though, you know, it is a big time commitment to, to do the technical stuff, to do the editing, the sound, always looking for ways to improve it and get the word out there. Um, and, uh, um, post about it, post on social media. I mean, social media in itself can be a full-time job. So, um, it, it's definitely a big, I'm sure, you know, as you know, it's a big time commitment. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I don't want to downplay that, but I'm pretty lucky in the fact that he does a lot of the technical stuff. That's great. Well, I mean, it's just, um, I, I don't think it's true that you're not creative. I think anybody who's <laughs> starting their own business is creative. Uh, a little bit. Right, right. A little bit in certain ways, maybe. <laughs> yeah. And uh, is there anything that, uh, oh, oh, tell me, um, before we get to the end, uh, wrapping up, tell me about your experience, like being on Dr. Oz or Fox's Chasing News or Good Day. Is this related to the podcast? How, how did that happen? What was it like? Um, yeah. So that's, it's pretty funny. You know, I think being in New York, um, crazy things happen. Um, a lot has been, um, so, well, a lot of the media stuff happened when I first started the house call practice. I had a patient who became very Instagram famous and he's the largest cat in New York. His name is Cat Stradamus. Well, his name is Samson, but his handle on Instagram is Cat Stradamus. <laughs> and, um, we did everything from like TMZ, Harry Connick Jr., Good Day New York, um, Inside Edition, and everybody wanted to know, is this cat healthy? Why is he so big? So the owner was kind of really happy to let me take the spotlight in a lot of those. Uh, so we did a lot of that, and at the same time, I got a phone call from a friend uh, from Dr. Oz looking to do a segment on pet food, and they wanted to film it in New York, and they wanted to know who was a veterinarian in New York that they could use. So um, I came up, and they, they came to me, and we filmed a little segment. And so that was really fun. Um, and then you know, I get a few media opportunities that come up just because of Richie, you know, he's in that world of, of media. Um, he's represented by some great Hollywood agents. Uh, and so we work together sometimes to do, um, to get some media gigs. So. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty fun. So was the cat healthy? <laughs> I'm yeah. <kidding. laughs> really healthy. And as a matter of fact, because so many people ask that I, created a big uh, media opportunity where I, um, and health opportunity where I set up for him to have a echocardiogram and an abdominal ultrasound at Blue Pearl. So we spent a day of it. We brought some cameras. We showed everybody. He had a full clean bill of health. So no I did, cardio blood work. Megaly. did a, what? <laughs> no cardiomegaly. Right. No, no cardio Megley, no HM because he's a Maine Coon. So, right. So, right. So we did all of that to prove he's a really healthy guy. So, yeah. Interesting. And so are you planning on continuing trying to get more media appearances? Um, will that boost your house call practice or your podcast? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I love doing the media. Um, I'm, I'm not shy. I love getting the word about out there. I love teaching people all about veterinary medicine um, and um, the good, the bad, the struggles, answering their pet questions, things like that. So it's definitely something I would love to continue to do. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting road. It's definitely not for everybody, but I, I love it. So hopefully there'll be more of it. I do also have a following on Instagram. Um, where I post a lot, I post some pets tips. So my, my Instagram handles, I've got two actually. One is more of a personal page. That's Dr. Lisa Lippman, D-R-L-I-S-A 
L I P P M A N. And then there's my um, one, I have 130, around 130,000 followers is at vet in the city underscore. Vet in the city underscore. Yeah. Okay. And that's on so, Instagram. Okay. Yeah. So it's super fun. It's me and my dog and, and really pretty dog pictures. I started a, a while ago as a curated account. Um, it just uh, really pretty dog photographs. And now it's me and my dog and also dog photographs. So. All right. Well, Dr. Lipman, um, would you like to offer um, any last words of advice for future vets? Last words of advice. Let's see. Um, you know, I think a, a little bit of everything that I said. So just, you know, make sure when you take your first job, you know, try your best you can to make sure it's going to be in a place where you feel comfortable and supported and, um, you know, find what you love to do and do it. Don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. So. Mm -hmm. And consult a lawyer for your contract before you sign yeah. the contract. <laughs> yes, do that. Yes. Okay. Dr. Lipman, last thing, do you have any um, favorite charity that you'd like to mention to let the listeners know about? Yeah, I've been working with a charity that I just love, love, love called Animal Lighthouse Rescue recently. Um, they uh, fly in dogs from Puerto Rico. Uh, and um, they're just they're an amazing organization. They practice, they let me practice gold standard medicine. Even though they're a rescue, they always want everything to be done right. They just make it life so easy for me, so great for the animals. They're an incredible organization. So, Animal Lighthouse Rescue. All right. Well, I'll have a link to that in the show notes. Dr. Great. Lipman, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. 